listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast. I recently got back to New York after spending two weeks in Amsterdam facilitating retreats for psilocybin at synthesis. And once you hop back into New York, it never really slows down. So it's been hitting the pavement. And then Burning Man is coming up next week. So if you'll be at Burning Man, I'm giving a, or I'm on a panel at Camp Mystic from 1230 to 145 on Saturday, September 1st. And the panel's about ayahuasca, microdosing, startups, and leadership. So if you plan on going to the playa, maybe go ahead and check that out. There are a couple talks coming up that you should be aware of. One is in San Diego about microdosing. It's September 7, and then I'm giving a talk in LA on microdosing on September 8. So put those in your calendar if you're in the SoCal area. You can find out more details uh, on the AWARE Project website. We'll put it in the show notes, so you can check it out if you want to get more details about those talks. And those are going to be about microdosing. I will give a talk and we'll have a small panel of people who have either experienced microdosing or have some understanding of it to discuss it. Today's episode is with a good friend of mine, Adam Strauss, who is a comedian. He runs a comedy show called The Mushroom Cure, where he talks about curing his OCD with psilocybin mushrooms. But it turns out, in fact, and what you'll learn from the interview in that is that he didn't really necessarily cure his OCD with mushrooms, but that it's much more of a journey beyond that. I went over to Adam's apartment in Brooklyn. We sat down, had a great time, went back and forth about a number of topics, including 2CE, a psychedelic analog, bad trips with 2CE, a little bit of Adam's personal history and in, in getting involved in psychedelics and where that's led him. Because Adam's a, a friend of mine, and we were actually just out dancing last night on a rooftop in Brooklyn. Um, this is a very casual, easygoing interview. It's a great time. And, Adam's fucking hilarious. So I'm sure you'll really enjoy this episode. So without further ado, I bring you Adam Strauss. You've had your fair share of psilocybin, huh? I have. I've had I've had fewer psilocybin experiences than people might assume who just know about my show and the title of the show. I remember one reviewer said, you know, something like something about the show. It was, he was drawing a metaphor and he's like, much like the the mushrooms Adam Strauss loves so much. I don't know if I'd say I love mushrooms. I respect them. I, I think in terms of personal enjoyment, yeah, mushrooms have, they've never been particularly fun for me. Well, you haven't seen the show yet, but if you come, you'll see they actually, they led to some traumatic experiences for me as well that were ultimately healing. It was never an easy path for me with mushrooms. Are there other substances that you've then utilized? Like, for example, I know with me, acid is always... Yeah, been my go-to. In fact, yep. I love acid so much. I got it tattooed on my uh, on my ankle. Oh, really? The, the, yeah, the, the, the molecular structure. <laughs> just yeah, just in just case like after a... the apocalypse, the formula is lost. <laughs> exactly. Like, we'll have it on my we, ankle. <laughs> we still have fully functioning chemistry labs, but yeah. no one has the formula. <laughs> That's totally can bring right. your severed ankle to the <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> bastion, <laughs> its <laughs> underground bunker, and. Sorry, that got unnecessarily uh, unnecessarily grim. Uh, hopefully, your hopefully your ankle will be attached to you. Hopefully, and, yeah, yeah, that's the idea that I yeah. survived. The right, because right, you have value. They're like, well, he can't hunt, he can't farm, but he does have the recipe for LSD tattooed exactly. on him. So. <laughs> yeah. We'll need that to birth a new world. After we, the will, we will, we will, right? absolutely. It's, it's undeniable. Though I, I think mushrooms would do quite well in a post-apocalyptic world. I mean, they seem to thrive in uh, situations of dissolution, decay, turnover, change. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're fantastic tools. So do you have these other I, psychedelics that you? Yeah, like, well, I, I would say nicer. I, I would say LSD would be top on the list uh, okay. for me. I mean, I had the show is called The Mushroom Cure. You know, it's the true story of how I tried to treat my very debilitating for many, many years OCD with psychedelics. It's called The Mushroom Cure because the study that inspired my quest was to date still the only study of um, of any psychedelic for OCD. It was out of the University of Arizona, uh, Francisco Moreno very small pilot study of psilocybin for OCD, just nine subjects. I don't know if you've, if you've read that study. It's an interesting study uh, in a number of ways. The short version is it was effective. The study was called Safety, Tolerability, and Efficacy of Psilocybin for, I think, Treatment-Resistant OCD, and it definitely had mm-hmm. efficacy. Uh, one of the interesting things is 
so this was not unlike the studies that are happening now of you know pretty much all psychedelic therapies now really psychedelic assisted psychotherapy so the the medicine or drug session is embedded in a context of a lot of you know preparation preparatory therapy sessions integration sessions this was not that they just gave people psilocybin in an inpatient overnight setting there were therapists present but if memory serves there wasn't i'm quite certain there wasn't any sort of preparation in terms of what are you looking to achieve or but people still had a remission. And the most interesting thing about this study, well, there are two things that are very interesting. One is, I don't wanna to get too wonky here, but the dose response curve was nonlinear. What I mean by that is some people had pretty significant uh, results on very, very low doses, which I thought was interesting and kind of speaks, I guess I'm bringing it up because obviously microdosing is part of your, uh, your mission, your Repertoire. Your repertoire, <laughs> yes. Your <laughs> shtick. <laughs> the shtick, yeah. yeah. Pops and shtick. <laughs> Microdosing. So, uh, so it was interesting. But the other, the really interesting thing, the thing that um, inspired me is one subject. So they didn't follow up with people, I think, after, they followed up for them for like a week afterwards. And after a week, some people still had dramatic symptom reduction, some didn't. But one subject, if memory serves, and I've done a lot of psychedelics in my life, so memory does not serve as well as it once did. But I, I don't think they actively followed up, but somehow one of the subjects, maybe he reported back to them, six months later, he was still symptom-free. And so they didn't use the word cure anywhere in this study, but I read this, and I read this study holed up in my apartment at the real depths of my OCD. I mean, I was not functioning. I was, yeah, my, my life was not worth living, and I was, you know, at a stage where I was contemplating ending my life. And I'd been on every possible medication, all the SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, uh, Effexor, you know, Benzo, Xanax, Lamictal, everything. Seen all sorts of specialists, nothing had helped. And I read this study and I saw, okay, six months later, this guy doesn't have OCD symptoms. That to me sounds like a cure. And so I figured I had nothing to lose by trying to, uh, to cure myself. I didn't have a lot of experience with psychedelics at that point in time. Now, I, I had done them in college, of course, as, as almost everyone does. <laughs> yeah. But they didn't work for me. And I now know the reason they didn't work for me is because I was on high-dose SSRIs. I was on very high dose. Uh, at that time in college, I think I was on Paxil. Some people on SSRIs still can work with psychedelics, but some can't. And for me, they really didn't, they didn't have any effect. Um, so I really had no psychedelic experience. But yeah, it was this case of, I don't have anything to lose. So I read that study and I decided I would try to cure myself. So what was that experience like? Well, that experience was um, a 90 minute show. So it's a long, <laughs> long nuanced answer. I talk about, in stand-up, I talk about the show sometimes and I'm like, you know, people ask me, well, did it work? Did you cure your OCD? And I always tell them the same thing. I say, buy tickets. I'm not just gonna give you the answer. And then they say, but I'm your mother. I'm just concerned about you. I don't care, mom. Go to the mushroomcure.com. Buy to no, I will give you the, the, the short version. It worked, but not in the way I thought it would work. I was looking at, oh yeah, so first to just tie the, close the loop on your last question. So the show is called The Mushroom Cure because that study is what inspired the show. But oddly enough, at this point in time, it was very difficult to find mushrooms in New York. So before I ever did mushrooms, I did LSD. I had quite a bit of experience with uh, mescaline containing cactus, radicii, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, San Pedro, Peruvian torch. And I also uh, delved into the wonderful world of research chemicals, basically mm. Sasha Shulgin's, you know, pet compounds. Which ones did you? A lot of them. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying I still have a lot of them in my freezer. So what did I do? 2CE, which was at first very helpful and then turned terrifying. I had probably the most traumatic trip of my life. Okay. Not probably, definitely. On, on 2CE. Is 2CE like an enactogen? Is it a... It's a well, it's no, I, I, I wouldn't call it that. It's, Shulgin calls it one of his magical half dozen. One of his half dozen chemicals that he felt had the most potential to really alleviate human suffering and open minds and hearts and consciousnesses. But he also talks about it has a sort of, at best, neutral character. One of the reasons I love LSD is because there's a bit of a lift to it. It's not speedy in the way uppers are. It's not like Coke. I've had LSD trips that haven't been fun, but it's kind of hard, right? There's, it pushes you in the direction of, I think, wonder and, and joy. 
Uh, so there's a bit of a positive effective push, I would say, behind LSD. 2CE is more neutral. It feels very, very clear. I, I love LSD also because of the clarity. I mean, I've dealt with cops on four hits of LSD and, and been fine. I couldn't imagine doing that on an equivalent dose of mushrooms. 2CE is even more clear headed. It's, it's, yeah, and that can be eerie in a way. It almost feels like sometimes you're in this liminal space, but alone, mm. by which I mean, Certainly ayahuasca, it seems like most people have a sense of some sort of entity. Mushrooms, often people talk about mushroom consciousness. LSD, maybe not so much, but there is still that kind of push. And I certainly feel like there is an intelligence to LSD, absolutely. 2CE, I, it, there's something that can feel a bit alien or impersonal about it. I, I had three trips total. One was... But not alien like DMT alien. Alien is in like... No, not alien like that bizarre funhouse, more alien like impersonal maybe is a better word. Also, I'm talking a little bit of bullshit right now because I only did it three times at significant dose levels. Sure. Uh, four times, uh, which I don't think is enough to really get the character of anything. Okay. And, I, and I'm a firm believer in set and setting is, I think, I think set, setting and dose is a lot more determinative than a specific chemical compound. I've often thought that like, like to me, high dose mushrooms is more similar to high dose LSD than high dose mushrooms is to low dose mushrooms. That's my own personal, yeah. So, so 2CE, yeah, I wouldn't rule out doing it again. I had one pretty wondrous experience that actually seemed like it was potentially a breakthrough with the OCD. Do you want to go down this rabbit hole now? Yeah, let's go all down right, this rabbit right. hole. So, yeah, yeah. so we'll, we'll see if I can, by the end of this, I'll tie it all back around. Is this bonus footage for the, the mushroom cure? It, so the mushroom cure is now about a 90 minute long show. Uh -huh. But if you look at earlier versions and earlier reviews, the reviews, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna play false humility. The reviews have been very, very positive. But many of the early reviews also mentioned the show was fucking long. They might not have used the expletive, but uh, Time Out New York, you know, it was a great review. They named it a critic's pick, but they also said something like at, you know, over two hours, the show could use a trim or two. And I've taken that to heart, both out of respect for the audience. It's to be sitting and watching one person for over two hours is draining, but mostly for myself. I mean, yeah, the show is on a, from a stamina perspective, it's, it's a motherfucker to get through. So I've cut out a lot. And unfortunately, what I've cut out mostly have been the trips. So there's really only a few trips recounted in the mushroom cure. Of course, there's a mushroom trip, there's a cactus trip. Um, and one of the trips that was in the show that I really liked were this succession of two, two CE trips very close together that unfortunately got cut and I'll give you the short version. All right, yeah, okay, this is, nice, good, this is good. Yeah, and, and it, it hurt me to cut these because this was part of the journey for me. So, so the two CE trip. This is circling back to the mushroom cure. So yeah, so I was looking for a cure. So this got cut because it wasn't instrumental to the cure, but it, these were significant experiences for me. The first time I did two CE, I actually had quite a few more trips. First time I did it, I took, I think, uh, with this woman who was my girlfriend at the time, who's sort of the other major character in the show. Now, it's me alone uh, up there on stage, but I kind of depict her. And her story, she was a, um, she was training to get her PhD in psychology. I met her randomly. I met her in Times Square doing a comedy show. It doesn't get more random than that. She was visiting from Kansas, where she had just about graduated college. She was about to move to California to get her PhD. She was in New York for a psychology conference. We met at this comedy show. We hit it off. We started a sort of long distance relationship. I didn't know until we'd been together, I don't know, maybe it was her second or third visit, that it emerged that she had inadvertently cured her suicidal depression with psychedelic cactus. It was a pure coincidence or divine intervention, however you want to look at it, that very soon after I read this study that set me off on this path of trying to cure my OCD with psychedelics, I met this woman who had done it and was a psychologist. And so she was, um, she's a big part of the story. So the first time with 2C was with her. We took fairly low doses, uh, not super low. I, I, I had and still unfortunately have a pretty prodigious tolerance for psychedelics. I think because I've been off the SSRIs for a decade now but it seems like there's still some sort of residual tolerance. Mm. Either that or it's just, you know, my ego just <laughs> clinging for dear life. But I take pretty, what McKenna would call heroic doses, but they don't feel particularly heroic for me. It just feels like that's kind of what I need to experience the effects. So, but with 2C, I knew its reputation. I researched it a lot online and I knew it had a reputation of, it could be wondrous, but it could also be terrifying. So 
I started off, I think, maybe 12 milligrams orally, a fairly conservative dose, though it could be strong. I think she took eight. I remember we were walking around Central Park, and it was like, do you feel anything? Uh, I don't know. Let's look, you know, looking at bushes, they kind of seem to be moving. It was one of these things where maybe there's threshold effects, but hard to tell. Finally, eight hours later, we got back to my apartment. You know, I'd wanted to get high on something. I was a little disappointed, so I was like, all right, let me, uh, let's smoke some weed. And... I took a huge bong rip and I exhaled the smoke and I'm actually in, in contrast to psychedelics, I have a low tolerance for weed. I get real high real easily and I expect it to get just obliterated and it had no effect whatsoever. Hmm. And it was kind of eerie because it was like, all right, well then this 2CE must be doing, I, I must be affecting me in some way. Like I clearly am altered and off baseline if taking a massive bong rip of high potency marijuana has no discernible effect. So that was intriguing. Uh, she went back to, at this point she was in California. She went back to California. I was like, all right, let me try this again. So a week or two later, I decided to up the dose significantly. I took 20 milligrams orally, which is a high dose. And three or four hours in, I was, I remember I was in Washington Square Park and I'm watching the cobblestones and they're kind of waving. I'm doing hand gestures, which does not, is not, is not good craft for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of breathing and, and, uh, and morphing a little bit, but I still feel totally clear headed. Um, I remember I called Hamilton Morris, who is, and, and is a good friend and was kind of with me a lot of these experiences. And I was like, I'm four hours in, is it going to get any stronger? And he's like, no, nah, it probably won't get any stronger. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll go home and snort a little bit. And I hope Hamilton doesn't want me saying this, but he, he was like, yeah, you know, snort a little bit. <laughs> so I went back to my apartment um, and I snorted. I had a very accurate milligram scale that I may or may not have now. And I snorted, I remember just four milligrams of 2CE and it came on real quick. And I lay down on my couch and in about 30 seconds, I entered this state Basically, what Shulgin would call plus four experience, which for listeners who are not familiar, Shulgin, on the Shulgin scale, plus four is the highest number, though he also stresses that it's not sort of a, a linear ranking, but the idea behind a plus four is this what he calls a peak mystical experience. So kind of akin to Samadhi and Zen can show this experience of oneness with everything, the, the dissolution of subject-object duality, the just isness. And I had that experience. For, I don't know how long it was because time ceased to exist and then my mind jumped in and was like oh this is it you're having it. you're having the plus four this is going to fix you and of course once my mind jumped in well now I'm a subject in a world of objects and and I lost it and I tried to get back there but I couldn't but it was like all right this stuff is the answer this is going to lead me there this 2CE so I waited exactly one week so that there wouldn't be tolerance and I figured all right I took 20 milligrams orally four milligrams snorted four milligrams this time I'll take 24 milligrams orally and I'll hopefully have that experience for hours instead of moments. Did it. Four hours later, exact same fucking thing. I think I was in at Washington Square Park. I think I was at Hudson River, but basically like some visuals, but feeling otherwise totally sober. So I went back to my apartment and this time I snorted six milligrams and I immediately knew I'd made a terrible mistake. <laughs> and I, I just was coming on just way too hard and way too quickly. But I was like, all right, go to my couch again, just breathe, just, and I'm trying to breathe. And it was like, I was inhaling, but I wasn't exhaling. I was just getting more and more tense and full of air. And I'm like, no, I'm everything, I'm everything. Just melt into everything, just melt into everything. And then I had the thought, no, I'm not everything. I'm the only thing. I'm the only thing that's real. I've created this whole universe to distract me from the fact that I am completely, oh yeah, I forgot, we posted about this a little bit on Facebook. Yeah, this is the experience. I created this whole reality to distract me from the horrifying truth that I'm completely alone in the universe. I've always existed, I always will exist, and I'll always be horribly alone. And this wasn't even a thought, it was just, it was a certainty. It was that psychedelic, you know, what it, how does Michael Palm refer to it? I, I can't remember the term he uses, but it just, it was, in that moment, it was truth to me. I knew it was true. I didn't want it to be true. And so I, I think I called Hamilton. I couldn't reach him. I called my friend Dave and he picked up the phone and I was, and I remember I said, cause I was, still had some clarity even around this. I said, I don't know why I'm calling you cause 
I'm just talking to myself. I created you. <laughs> and he's like, I don't think you created me. <laughs> and it got more and more horrifying. And I was like, all right, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to jump out the window. And I actually opened my window. And then I realized, wait, I'm this building. I'm the cement I would impact upon. I'm the force of gravity causing this. I can't die. I'm the only thing that is. I'm trapped forever in solitary confinement. And... Eventually, I came down. I mean, that's the, the good and bad thing about drugs is you always do come down despite what some of the anti-drug propagandists would have us believe. You don't believe you're a glass of orange juice forever. So I did come down, but... And I, my rational mind started kicking in. Okay, well, I probably had a glimmer of that same oneness that I'd sensed the week before, but my ego got afraid, so I put the spin on it that, sure. you know, so that I didn't go deeper into that. And yeah, I think that's valid. But that residue of terror stayed with me. My OCD was much worse. I was, I was a fucking wreck. Like I remember walking down the streets of New York and like a car would backfire and I would jump. I, I actually had some PTSD from this experience. And, uh, and so how did you, like, what did that look like ongoing then in terms of, because what you're referring to is, I believe they call it like salat. So, so Solipsism. So, solipsism. Solipsism. It was so, the solipsistic. Solipsism. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because yep. I had this when I drank ayahuasca yeah. in Costa Rica. It wasn't near as stark yeah. as that, but it was this recurring thought after I drank ayahuasca for four straight nights. I remember I went to this little beach town called Nosara mm -hmm. in Costa Rica, gorgeous place, and was just walking up and down the beach there and just thinking like, oh yeah, I've, like, I've manifested this entire reality yeah. out of my individual self, and that in some ways is true. Yes. Which I think is part of the intimidating, scary element of when you're experiencing that on psychedelics, there's an element of that, that, that it's true, but that's also like obviously you're interacting yeah. and there's this sense of intersubjectivity with you and the world around you. So it's always, for me, it's like solop solopsism? So, solipsism, I think is how it's pronounced. Solipsism. I don't know if I've ever heard of Solipsism, yeah, it's, it's, solipsism. Like, it's like this sense of you can you know, obviously, it, the, the hint of that is you can change your reality yeah. in a way, but, right, but the right. darker side is like you're just creating this reality as you go along and everything that's out here is from you. Right. Which is really, like, fucking scary if you get into it, you know? And maybe the distinction is the question, are we the source or are we sort of... Clearly, we have some... I shouldn't say clearly, but I believe, as it sounds like you do, that... that well, I think our thoughts shape our experience, and that's all we have is our experience. So I think we do have, uh, we do shape our own reality. But I also, at this moment in time, I don't believe that I am, I believe that there is a source that I am of, but not, that is not solely Adam Strauss. Um, and I think that's the distinction. So I, I, yeah, I absolutely do. I believe that, I don't know what's going on, but I think there's something going on. I believe there's an intelligence here. I think it's wildly unscientific to say there's, it's just random. I mean, there's order everywhere we look. I don't understand that intelligence. I don't think that intelligence originated with me. I think I'm part of it. Language kind of breaks down as we talk about this, because I don't think there's, there's not a good way. I mean, language, by definition, it kind of, Maybe not by definition, but it segments things. It boundaries. It puts right, boundaries right. around this things. This is a box. This is a sheet. This is a wall. Uh, this is a computer. I think there is that element of truth in that the way we choose to view things. I mean, I say this in stand-up a lot. You know, I think reality is subjective. And if you think I'm wrong, you're right. So I, I, And I absolutely do believe that. But I also think that there's something going on that is beyond us yet connected to us. But in that moment, it was more like what you're describing where, no, I'm the only thing. There's nothing, it, it's just me. So how I got out of it was I kind of staggered around New York for a couple of months. And then I was like, I gotta get the fuck out of this city. I just, I, I need some nature, I need some peace. And so I wound up subletting my apartment and getting a place in Martha's Vineyard, a really cheap place and spent a month there and it was actually a really blissful experience. And I, I brought my psychedelics with me, so I didn't even smoke weed after this experience, but I got to Martha's Vineyard and about week three, I was like, I started feeling such peace and I decided one day, I remember I, I woke up, it was just this perfect little cottage I had near the ocean and there's like bunny rabbits hopping across the lawn, this perfect June day. And I just was like, I'm gonna take some acid today. And, and I did, and it was a good healing experience. 
And, uh, but there is still a residue of that experience, you know, because I do think there's some truth to that. That was the very traumatic 2C experience. And then years later, I did a pretty high dose orally, just orally, also in Martha's Vineyard, a solo trip where I think that might have been the last high dose solo trip I did. This was years after the period I talked about in the mushroom cure. And it was more just, yeah, I kind of went into this experience without any real intention, which I think can be mm. fine, but it was, <clears throat> I think the neutral character of 2CE combined with being alone, it was just kind of the visual enhancement. That's what I'll say about 2CE. Even though I never got real visuals from it and I don't get visuals from anything really, just things look more beautiful and clear and sharp. So that was fun being by the ocean, but there wasn't much that came out of that experience. But I, I would I would do it again under the right circumstances. And so 2CE is one of the, the research chemicals. Oh, right, yeah, certainly. It's back. cool because like on the podcast, I don't think we've ever really talked much about research chemicals. Like I've experienced 1P LSD, which okay, is yeah, more yeah. or less which, the same as right. regular LSD. I've not done that yet. Um, I've done 4ACO DMT. Oh yeah, I love that one. That I was, love that one as well, because it's an analog of psilocin, yes. psilocybin, right? Yeah, that one I went, I've done that more than any other. So that, um, uh, yeah, Hamilton and I were big fans of that. And I, I, yeah, I've taken that probably more than anything else if I think about it, because there was a period of my life, about a year, where I was doing that very regulated, all different dose levels. It was very interesting. I don't know what your experience was. Mine was, it was, it felt more controllable than mushrooms, but it didn't have sort of the mystical, chaotic edge that mushrooms, that give them some of their, it felt less magical, though still kind of magical. And I, I'm remembering this now. I would even use it as a social drug. I would take like five milligrams and you know go out to a bar and drink. Yeah, and, yeah. And you'd micro. And that's kind of like I used it before I gave a talk in Zurich a few months yeah. ago when I was talking about microdosing and self optimization. And I took, I think it was it was a microdose. Like yeah. I think it might have been five yeah. milligrams. And I just remember it was a really good talk. And what it does it ha for me, it has that cognitive clarity of LSD. Yeah with the heart kind of emotional feeling opening of psilocybin. But you don't get the kind of weird, fuzzy, yeah. chaotic edges of Damn, psilocybin. Damn, I may have to try this again soon, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I really did, because psilocybin is, you know, I don't like it at low dose levels, and I actually tried microdosing, we can talk about this, uh, but I, I tried microdosing recently, I didn't give it a real fair trial, but for ACO DMT, I, I did like it at low dose levels and high dose levels. And at high doses, what I found about it was the trip itself, I liked, but the afterglow was, I, I'd get this, I'd take 40 or 50 milligrams, I'd have this incredibly euphoric afterglow. So for a while, I would time it out, like if I was going to a party, mm -hmm. you know, I'd take, I'd probably, I'd take maybe 40 milligrams at like 6 p.m. Um, you know, I'd work with the high, and then at like 10 p.m., I'd pretty much, because also psychedelics tend to last not that long for me, so by 10 p.m., the acute effects would, would be over. I'd still be a, <clears throat> a little bit high. I had this incredible euphoric afterglow that would just be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done that in years. 4-ACO-DMT was a good one. 4-HO-DIPT, another psilocybin analog. For, so we, we had 4-ACO, the 4-HO, the 4... There's one other. 4-ACO or 4-HO-MIPT, 4-HO-DIPT. There were five or six psilocybin analogs that I tried. One of them, I think it was for home mipped, was interesting in that it was very physically stimulating. Mm. I think I only did it once or twice. And then the phenethylamines, 2CE, 2CT7, 2CB, of course. I did not try them, but I had them. Uh, DOM. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. DOC. DOM is the one that lasts like three days or something. Probably like not that. really three days. It's, if you read at high doses, it can. But yeah, you're in, it's gonna be a probably 24 hour ride. But there are some reports of people, I mean, DOM is notorious. So that's a, that's a Shulgin invention. And it was sold as STP in the, I don't know, 70s maybe, 60s, 70s, in the, I think in the Bay Area in California. Basically Shulgin gave a lecture. It looks like someone probably copied down his slide, synthesized it, and they were selling it on the street, but they were selling it in 10 milligram tablets, which is a monstrous dose. Uh. Like DOM, I believe, I mean, I haven't thought about DOM in years, but I think like a an active dose or like a full trip dose could be, I don't know, five milligrams, three okay. milligrams. Okay. And then this was compounded. It could take four hours to come up. So you take a 10 milligram pill of STP. People are used to LSD, of course. You know, you feel the effects relatively quickly. You wait an hour and a half, you're not feeling anything. You take a second pill. You wait another hour, still not feeling anything. You take a third pill. 
our hour four kicks in, you have 40 milligrams of DOM floating our system, and it led to this flood of emergency room admissions uh, until someone eventually, Shulgin, figured out what it was. And so, yeah, I did not get to try that. It's, it's on the list. Yeah, so there were probably 15, 20 different things that I procured, but yeah, the four substituted tryptamines, four ACO DMT was the one I did the most. And, but I will say, yeah, nothing I, I tried exceeded LSD for me in terms of enjoyment and, and insight, I would say. What about efficacy? Well, for, so for the OCD, so, so the other reason the show is called The Mushroom Cure, even though the word cure was not used in this study, is because as someone with OCD, it's a little tricky, do I still have it? I certainly have perfectionism and obsessive tendencies, but certainly as someone who had very debilitating OCD, OCD is characterized by very black and white thinking. You know, things are great or they're terrible. Things are, uh, you know, th this is gonna work or it's not gonna work. So I was looking for this, you know, silver bullet cure, something that would just take away my OCD forever. In my mind, I had this sort of almost childish view that if I could have a plus four, I'd be cured. Cause this woman, Grace, my girlfriend at the time had had a plus four in cactus and it really had cured her depression. Again, she hadn't aimed to do that. She was just a kid having fun and had this profound experience. But for me, it was like, okay, I need to have this experience and it'll cure me. And so as a result, I was doing this stuff in a pretty stupid way. I was doing a lot of different drugs close together, various dose levels, not well controlled set or setting. I was doing it sometimes when I was not in a good mindset. The setting was generally New York City, which I'd say is not optimal for high dose trips. It can be okay. So it's a little hard to disentangle. Well, what helped the most? Certainly I had a number of trips that were helpful in different ways, including mushrooms were very helpful. I mean, the most traumatic trip I had was also, which led to a 911 call. Uh, and cops showing up at my, I was living in Martha's Vineyard at this point, cops showing up. Uh, that ultimately proved to be very helpful. But LSD also proved to be very helpful. I had one trip particular in Brooklyn where I was able to, well, I'll tell you what happened. So this also is, is not in the, in the live show, so it's good, no spoilers. Good, no spoilers yet. So I was with this woman, um, Grace is her name, and uh, my girlfriend, and we were, we were at my brother's apartment in Brooklyn, and I think it was only the second time I'd ever taken LSD, and I took three tabs, and you know I'm coming up, and she's in the living room. I'm lying in my brother's bed and just kind of trying to relax into you know the energy as it's coming up and and feeling into it, and suddenly there's this really loud sound. It turns out that people are moving into the apartment below my brother's. And the whole reason we come out here to trip is his apartment was quiet. And, and so now as I'm coming up on this LSD trip, suddenly the worst thing is happening. I'm not gonna have a quiet setting at all. There's loud movers, people bellowing and dropping heavy shit and yelling up and down the stairs. And I immediately got angry. My body tensed up and, and there was this fight in my body. I, it was like I was, my body was and my emotions and my mind were sort of fighting against this. No, I don't want this to happen. And then I became aware of it on a meta level. I suddenly realized, oh, I'm actually, I'm fighting what's happening right now. And that's not gonna help at all. And actually right now, my entire experience has now become about this, the, the noise from these movers. And I was able to just kind of relax into it, allow the noise to be there, not wanting it to be there, not even liking it, but not fighting it, just and, and kind of observing how I how how that would feel in my body when they drop something, really just being present with it. And the next day, Grace and I were at this Chinese restaurant, Joe Shanghai in Lower Manhattan, which is a madhouse and uh, very popular and. We got seated. There's always these group tables. We got seated at this table where I've basically been, I've been there. you've been there. Oh, yeah, what's the traditional the soup thing? dumpling? The, the soup, soup dumpling. Dumplings. That's yeah. what you go there for. The soup dumpling. We should go, man. I haven't we been should. there. Yeah. We haven't been there in years. Yeah, yeah those yeah, are great. Yeah. yeah, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm seated like right near kind of a high traffic area, and waiters are brushing by me, and people are talking loudly, and I realize I'm getting kind of tense about it, and I'm able to do the same thing I did on the trip the day before. I just kind of let it be there. And I start being able to do that with the, L with the not the LSD, with the OCD. 
I'd find an obsessive thought and I'd see, oh, it causes this tension in my body when I'm obsessing, this contraction. Okay, just relax into it. Relax into that energy that you don't want to be there. Let it fill you. And it was pretty profound for a few days. And then it did not last. And I think part of the reason it didn't last is, you know, you look at the research happening now with MAPS and, and everyone else, and there's so much emphasis on integration. And I didn't have that. And I wasn't, it wasn't even in my lexicon. It was like, you know, yeah, no, this, the right trip is going to fix me. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know or even give much thought to how do I apply this in a proactive conscious way in my life. So it didn't last. But those sort of experiences, and particularly mushrooms, but others too, ultimately when I reached a point where I saw sort of the OCD was how devastating it was, and I realized that psychedelics had given me the template to find some peace by essentially doing the same thing by accepting. That, that's how I'd say it helped me because I've been, see OCD, you have an obsessive thought. My thought, I don't want to get too much into my symptoms just because we could talk about it for hours, but classic example would be someone who has contamination fear. So their thought is I'm contaminated, They're, they have a, a ritualistic urge to wash their hands. Uh, my thought was more I'm making a mistake or I'm making the wrong decision and I would have an incredible urge to reverse my decision. But either way, um, you engage in this ritual, washing your hands or reversing your decision, because in the short term it works. When you engage in that ritual, the anxiety goes down for a little bit. You find some relief from that obsessive thought and that anxiety, but then it creeps back up. So then you repeat the ritual again. You wash your hands again, reverse your, and, and, and the anxiety goes down, but it creeps back up and you get trapped in this cycle. So I understood intellectually that if I could open up to the anxiety I was feeling and the obsessive thoughts, if I could allow them to be there, not necessarily believing them, but just let them be there, that I wouldn't have to engage in this behavior to avoid them because they were already there. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. By accepting something, you've undercut the incentive to engage in an avoidant behavior. So I understood that perfectly well. But acceptance is such a, it's such a, fascinating, tricky thing, because it's not an intellectual cognitive thing. Acceptance is more of a physical action, or I often like to say it's a spiritual thing. It's that letting go, it's, but it's something that really happens more in your body than your mind. It doesn't really happen in the mind at all. Your mind can say, I accept, but at a physical level, you have to let go of the resistance. And it was only on psychedelics that I had that physical experience. Mm -hmm. I had meditated for years. I had tried all sorts of cognitive behavioral therapy that had not given me that physical experience of acceptance, but psychedelics did. Mm -hmm. And once I had that experience, and once things got so bad with the OCD that I knew I had no other choice, psychedelics had given me now this pathway where, okay, this is the way out, is I accept this. It may not feel good, I may still have anxiety, I may still have unwanted thoughts, but I'm not gonna be trapped engaging in rituals for nine hours a day, which I, I often would be. So as part of that process, like what did you find helped then with integration over the long term? So like, yeah. is it just a constant matter, you know, a metaphor that we've been using in our uh, synthesis retreats when we're doing integration circles mm -hmm. afterwards is we use the metaphor of like going to the dentist, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically like uh -huh. every day you brush your teeth and you floss. Yeah. And that's kind of like, a mindfulness practice, whether that's breath work, meditation, yoga, right? Something that cultivates acceptance and presence. Right, I like that. And yeah. then every six months, you have that more kind of intervention, so to say, where you go and get a deep clean. Right. Uh, with yeah. the dentist, but then with the, uh, you know, sense of I love that. I haven't heard that before. That's experience. great. Yeah. So Let me use that. That's how we try to like contextualize Yeah, yeah. That, no, right? it's, it's, it's helpful. It's the, it's, it's, yeah, I really like that. So in my case, I, I, I was lucky in that. Well, I had found this 12 step program for OCD called Obsessive Compulsive Anonymous, and that provided kind of this integration structure. Was this built off of alcoholics? Yes, Anonymous? it was. Okay. It was, yeah. It's basically, the idea is that OCD is an addiction, okay. uh, which I absolutely believe. You know, the more you engage in it, like any addiction, it, it works in the short term. An alcoholic, when they take a drink, they feel better. When they take five drinks, they feel even better. But over the long term, the next day, the next month, they feel worse. And same with OCD, when you engage in the ritual, I think anyone with OCD, if you really pay attention, you do feel better. That's why it's so fucking seductive. It feels good in the moment. And this is our evolutionary burden, unfortunately, is we evolved in a world where time was, you know, it was eat while you can, fuck while you can, you could die at any moment. You know, momentary pleasure is, outweighs everything. Mm -hmm. 
and so that's why addictions are so hard to break. So yeah, so it's it's basically AA, but for OCD. Oddly enough, I found it mapped very well onto the psychedelic lessons I'd had because the idea of abstinence is, and the idea of turning things over to a higher power really worked well. I could look at it as, all right, I'm not gonna engage in my ritual, that's abstinence, and turning it over to a higher power, that's acceptance. I'm gonna let it be there. I'm not gonna try to control and manipulate and figure out how to get this decision right. So that was very helpful. Um, and now, and again, the mushroom cure experiences, those were years ago. Uh, now, yeah, now I do follow more kind of the, I, I meditate daily, sometimes only for 10 minutes. Um, I do yoga often only for five or 10 minutes, but uh, you know, trying to do those practices. Mm -hmm. It's a struggle for me in this city though, in New York, because I think a big thing that really helps me is nature. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I, I, I don't know, I think we've talked about this. I'm gonna make the Bay Area more of my home base starting in October because really just for the nature. And I always wanna be clear on this. I'm not sitting here speaking as someone who's like, has this stuff licked, you know? I, I suffer from OCD a lot less than I did, but I still go through, you know, I'm still, uh, I would say, more emotionally volatile than the average person. Okay. Um, I experience strong emotions, positive and negative, and I struggle sometimes to work with them and not be swept away by them. I can experience moments of overwhelming anxiety, not infrequently. Despair, I mean, we can just go down the litany. My own practices, I guess I mentioned that in the context of your question. Yeah, I'm looking, I, I feel like I can do, I don't wanna say better, there's a judgment there. I want to, for my own sake, I, I would like to place more of a premium on finding daily practices that I can do that can set me up to live a more balanced life on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of joy in my life, but I certainly struggle with my obsessive tendencies. Perfectionism is, is a, you know, it, it can be a, a real problem. So have you tried microdosing? It sounds like you have. And so what has that experience been like for you? So not positive, but not, I'll be the first to confess, I did not give it a fair try. So LSD, I tried, first I tried after going to the third wave website, <laughs> I, I tried cutting up my, I had a tab, I tried cutting up my tab and I took, you know, it seemed like eyeballing at a 10th of a tab and it came from a reliable source in the Bay Area. I was back in New York. This was in, I think, March or February. I took a 10th of a tab expecting, now I, I've taken t seven tabs of, really potent LSD and, you know, been able to ride that out. It's been a ride, but so I was like, I probably won't feel anything. I was floored how it felt to me more like half a tab. It felt like I was, <clears throat> I mean, I was fine. I was able to, I had some work to do. I was able to talk on the phone, but the effects were not subtle at all. Mm. And they were not pleasant. And I think part of that is set and setting. It was a grim February or March day in New York. Mm. Uh, I wasn't looking for any sort of trip. Um, I had a lot on my plate work-wise, and it was quite unpleasant, quite unpleasant. But then something remarkable happened. Maybe, I, I did keep a journal of this, but I'm gonna say maybe seven or eight hours in, I had this wave of euphoria. I felt very present, quite joyful, like really totally clear-headed. I wasn't tripping at all. The trip was over, but it was this real afterglow that I'd never had on high-dose LSD. And so that was enough to make me think, okay, there's something here. Mm. So I tried again, you know, three, four days later, and I did what looked like a 20th of a tab and still quite strong. Okay. And still, and so I tried three or four times. The last time I, and so then I did, all right, I'm gonna do the liquid dilution thing. I did that. And I took, assuming this was an 100 microgram tab, which who, who knows, but I took what would have been the equivalent of three micrograms, and I swear I felt something. I mean, it could have been psychosomatic. It was very subtle. And this was, by this point, I was getting ready to leave to go to the Bay Area to do the show out there. And yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna have enough transition anyway. I'm gonna put this, this experiment on hold for now. <clears throat> Got to the Bay Area, uh, did not resume it. But then more recently, at the suggestion of you know, a mutual friend of ours, I, um, I guess I could use her first name probably, I don't know. Yeah, Kim, um, I tried microdosing mushrooms. Um, and... That I gave, I, I did that for probably about six weeks. And I was going for, you know, subperceptual doses. Okay. So I didn't really notice anything positive or negative. Yeah, didn't notice anything positive or negative. Uh, and then, this is exactly a week ago, was it? Yeah, I think it was last Tuesday. Um, so someone who's fairly experienced in this suggested, get it to the point where you actually do have some perceptual effects. 
I don't know what your thought is on that, but that's my belief. Yeah, as well. Like you yeah. wanna you wanna experience the range. Yep. Of impacts. Okay. Uh, so that you have, because from from my perspective, microdosing, it's less about sub perceptible and it's much more about how you can integrate psychedelics in a more consistent daily way to optimize health and well being. So it's not that it's working under the baseline of awareness. It's more like you, the the way it's altering your experience, you can actually use to. Well, it could be right. So I think physical wellness, you yeah. can take sub perceptible doses, and this will have an impact because of the efficacy of psychedelics in uh, gut inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we know that gut health is directly tied yeah. to things like depression. I don't know about this. What is the efficacy of psychedelics in gut health? Okay, is so psychedelics, especially like psilocybin and LSD, activate something called the 5-HT2A receptor. Right, which that, you know that about, I know. Right, right. And that's right. present in the gut as well as and, the brain. And 90% mm -hmm. of serotonin, 5-HT, right. is present in the gut. Only 10% is in the, in the mind. And, and when we activate those serotonergic mm -hmm. receptors with psychedelics, it has an anti-inflammatory effect in the gut. It basically significantly cuts inflammation. And what we know from recent research is that gut inflammation is directly tied to uh, depression, addiction, uh, PTSD, some of these other things. So I'm, I'm, just, only, yeah, I'm only perfectly aware of that, but I know there's been some, yeah. Right, and so I was just interviewing someone who is- I mean, I think, I don't think, I mean, can we go that far? I don't think, can we go so far as, as, as positing a causal link? Is the science that far along? Or is it more just that there seems to be some connection? That's a really good question. I yeah. think I think there has been. I'm always been, leery of kind of jumping the gun on this stuff. There's but, been some preliminary studies yeah, that have been done, yeah. and we know that. So it could be more "quote unquote" speculation. Yeah. But I know there has been some. We'll we'll what we'll do is in the show notes for the show. Okay. Cool. We'll kind of dig that up and put that in. Yeah, there. yeah. I'm very curious because about that. I recently did. You know how this ties into trauma, for example, or OCD. Yeah. Uh, addiction, depression, all of these things, is. Uh, I was interviewing Will Vanderveer, who uh, sure he's in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. He runs an integrative psych uh, psychiatry clinic where mm -hmm. he does ketamine treatment okay. for people. And he was on the MAPS phase two trials. Okay. Uh, helping for P MDMA? For, for MDMA for PTSD yeah. in Boulder. I think he was helping to run one yeah, or helping sure. out with that process. And I interviewed him and we were talking about this relationship between uh, ketamine, but also generally psychedelics mm -hmm. and physical well-being. And that before people can actually start to process the emotional trauma that is directly linked to things like addiction, depression, OCD, some of yeah. these things, like the developmental trauma, they first have to address the physical issues. So in other words, going into the emotional stuff is best, it's first best approach by actually like looking at diet, exercise, and sleep. Uh -huh. And then once diet, exercise, and sleep are better, then it's a little bit easier to dig in yeah. and kind of let those things off. So what we were talking about is this relationship between ketamine and physical wellness and how ketamine and psychedelics basically turn off inflammatory pathways in the gut. Uh, there's been wow. research that has been established about this. Wow. And by turning off those inflammatory pathways, it basically improves physical well-being, which again allows us to dig deeper into the emotional issues. Wow. So that I yeah, think yeah. could be, that's one of my hypotheses for why microdosing is effective at, for example, treating depression. Um, because I think some of it is what's going on in the mind. For example, we know that the 5-HT2A receptor is directly tied to neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. uh, there was just this recent research published about like DMT in rats and how oh, yeah. DMT can help with the growth of new dendrites and synapses. Mm -hmm. Kind of getting back to the point, yeah. which is like microdosing and what you were doing. Are we looking at just physical wellness, which susceptible doses will help with? Almost like taking fish oil. Yeah, right? Think right, of it as right. like a supplement. Yeah. Or are we actually trying to take this as a quote unquote drug that has a perceptible effect that we can then utilize to, to like orient ourselves to having more creativity, to being more right. present in relationships? Like you were talking about how you used to do 4 co DMT yeah. and go out. Yeah, yeah. You were doing that for a very specific yes. purpose. Yeah. Right? And I think there's something similar huh. with, with microdosing in that is how can we, you know, what what's the difference between 10 mics, 20 mics, 50 mics, and 100 mics? In terms of we take 10 mics for the physical wellness, we take 20 mics for brainstorming creativity, we take 50 mics to go to a concert and enjoy an experience, and we take 100 mics to actually dig into like self-reflection and self-awareness. Uh -huh. So that's how I try to think yeah, about, yeah. about microdosing is less sub-perceptible and much more like, no, we can play with these dose levels to facilitate certain outcomes in, yeah. in the here and now. Essentially. And so what, what's your personal regimen now? Yeah, so my personal regimen is I've been microdosing with, I've been doing the Paul Stamets stack, yeah. 
Have you heard of the Paul Stan no, stat? No, no. Okay, so Paul gave a great uh, pr presentation at Psychedelic Science. I, I saw that. I, I did see that. I don't know what the stack is, though. So I, I actually, I missed the beginning of it, and that because it was completely packed. I eventually weaseled my way into the back of the so room. So he gave this, if you look at the yeah. YouTube, the video on YouTube, okay. um, it's from the 12-minute mark to the 18-minute mark. Okay, so I probably missed that. You yeah. probably missed it. Yeah. And he leads in by talking about Terrence and Dennis McKenna's <laughs> Food of the Gods theory. Uh -huh. yeah, and sure. how psilocybin helped with co-evolution. Right, right. Visual acuity and peripheral arousal and all of that. All yeah, these good things. Stuff. Yeah. And then he went on to say, look, all this stuff about microdosing is really interesting because it kind of ties in oh, to this yeah. element yeah, of yeah. evolution. And I actually did kind of side note, but I did this really interesting interview with Peter Schostad Hughes, mm -hmm. who's a philosopher based in the UK. Mm -hmm. He writes for like Psychedelic Press okay. and, you know, talks about uh, the metaphysical aspects of the psychedelic experience and panpsychism, which comes uh -huh. back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of like everything is conscious, Connect. yeah, consciousness yep. embodied in it. And we had a really interesting conversation about the relationship between microdosing and transhumanism mm -hmm. in terms of how microdosing can help with this next evolutionary step, so to say, of what right. we're going through, which I think if you look at like Daniel Pinchbeck's work, yep. right, how soon is now, yeah. this next evolutionary step is being facilitated I, by actually, the ecological I, I, crisis. I had coffee with Pinchbeck yesterday and I had to tell him I haven't read his book yet. So. <laughs> okay, that, was probably, that probably didn't go over so well. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I was, I was, I was, well, it was actually because I was staying at the house where we have a mutual friend and they and they had a copy there and I saw it on my way out and I was like I probably shouldn't take this but yeah <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to reading it very much and it's a really I, good breaking book breaking open the head is one of my favorite books yeah Paul talks about a nootropic stack mm -hmm. in that presentation that he later talked as well about on the Joe Rogan podcast I don't know if you saw no I didn't his his interview there where it's basically you take lion's mane mm -hmm. which is a medicinal mushroom and you combine it with psilocybin mushrooms and then you take niacin as mm -hmm. well with it, which helps to uh, for the capillaries to open up, for the central yeah. nervous system to open up, so that the lion's mane and psilocybin, there's better absorption of okay. those substances. So I have these specific supplements that were made uh, for me that are psilocybin and lion's mane combined, mm -hmm. and then you take it with niacin, and I've yeah. been trying that for the past week and doing it about three times a week. And okay. so I'm taking it as like a nootropic stack yeah. to see the impact and efficacy on just like cognitive clarity and yeah. general well-being inflammation and that's how mostly like i've been going about it lately otherwise besides that before i give public talks yeah i'll usually microdose with acid yeah or for a co dmt that's right, more of right. like i i want to facilitate a certain outcome yeah right so i'll microdose because it makes me more extroverted yeah see i i would microdose if i if i noticed those effects and again maybe i didn't give it a fair trial i certainly didn't give it a fair trial so i was taking different batches but i was typically taking about very low doses because I was typically taking about 50 milligrams of not psilocybin, psilocybin containing mushrooms. And on Tuesday, a week ago, you know, I, a friend again who had suggested, well, take it, to, you, you know, you get some perceptual effects. And this friend is a, is a trained, he's part of this whole, you know, underground guide community in the Bay Area and has a lot of experience. So I did 100 milligrams. My last full mushroom journey was, was, was eight grams. So this is what, this is 180th of my last full mushroom journey. And I did not like 100, mic 100 milligrams. I really, it was, and I was, and in contrast to my LSD microdosing experiences, I was in a good mindset. It was, um, yeah, I was well rested and it just kind of made me, I felt a little bit depersonalized. It felt like I couldn't quite, it's hard to put into words. It's hard to articulate, but uh, it was, I felt, not well. I didn't like the way my body felt. These were subtle effects, but I felt, I felt worse than I had felt before I took it, quite significantly and noticeably worse. It felt like it kind of had almost a heart-closing effect to me. It felt like the joy that I'd felt when I woke up that morning looking forward to it, it was a nice day out, and I was, it felt like that joy was kind of shut off. And, you know, it's an N of one. It's one trial, so I shouldn't extrapolate too much, but based on that... I said, fuck it, I'm done with this microdosing thing. And this was my logic. My logic, which again is not scientific, but my logic was like, all right, well, if this is what it has, if this is the effect that has a barely perceptible doses for me, then why would I assume that it has a positive effect at subperceptible doses for me? Right. And so I, uh, and I, I didn't flush my stash down the toilet. I still have it, but I, I've, I've not taken it in a week, so. Huh. Yes. So what say you to that? Is yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I don't have much 
And I'll just say that yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm noticing a couple of things which I want to comment on. Yeah, please on. do. Because I am very open to, uh, it's not like I'm, I, I'm not at all anti-microdosing. And yeah, I, I, I would certainly, all the promising anecdotal data is enough to make me want to, you know, want to see if it can work for me. Well, I just think there's some interesting dynamics here. Like, yeah. Because on the one hand, you said that you're not sensitive at all to psychedelic, so that like a heroic dose <laughs> right. for you actually isn't as right. heroic as it might be for other people yet. Yet. With you talking about acid and mushrooms, you in, in talking about your microdosing experiences, it seems as if you are in fact very sensitive if a yeah. hundred milligrams of psilocybin because the dose levels that I'm taking right now are 150 milligrams. Yeah. And those are barely perceptible at all for me. Yeah. I have to take two and then I have this like, you know, it's just like a feeling kind yeah. of opening. Like I have to sit with it. It's it's not like acid where I'm like trying to come up with all these new ideas. It's like I have to sit with myself and be with myself. But that's at 300 milligrams. And wh well, and when you say you have to sit with yourself or be with yourself, what is that feeling? Is it a pleasant feeling or is it a... Not always. Sometimes yeah. like the last time I did this was in Amsterdam last week. I was tearing up quite a bit. Yeah. I was getting quite emotional. Had a little anxiety. I was a yeah. little concerned about some things. So it's not always positive necessarily. Yeah. LSD tends to be more positive yeah. on the whole. It tends to just have that more stimulating, like happy, extroverted effect. Yeah. Whereas with psilocybin, even with microdosing, it, it more can amplify how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think at least with me as a man and both as someone who's very dopamine driven, yep, sure. um, yep. I'm not always really sitting with those feelings. Yeah. So when mushrooms kind of put me into that, it's like, oh, I'm actually feeling sad or I'm feeling like alone or I'm feeling, yeah. I don't know if that's what it was for you, but that's how, that's how it's been for me oftentimes yeah. is how I contextualize. It is interesting that I have this sensitivity and I do seem to be very sensitive. I mentioned to marijuana and, and it may be that I'm sensitive to low dose effects, but it just takes high doses to really get me to a place where it feels like I'm not totally in control. I don't know. It is interesting. What are your future plans? My future plans. Yeah. So, uh, well, so the Mushroom Cure is running in New York through early September. I think we're, we're right now we're closing September 7th. We may go one more week, but probably not because I'm working on a new show that is going to uh, premiere in San Francisco it, uh, starting either October 5th or October 12th. I'm finalizing that right now. That show, I don't really know what it's about yet. I'm trying, I'm, I, it'll be more stand-up focused. Okay. I'm sure psychedelics will be a part of it. I don't think it'll be, you know, it, it won't be as psychedelically heavy as The Mushroom Cure. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's that. Uh, I do stand up pretty much every night when I'm in New York or, or most nights. And then, yeah, and I'm going to be launching my own podcast. I hope I've, so the last three podcasts I've done, I've announced this with the idea that by the time that podcast comes out, I'll have my podcast up and I've failed. I announced it on Shane Moss's podcast and in Duncan Trussell's podcast. Both of those have been out for a while and my podcast is not out. And this is kind of, are you starting a podcast just because all your buddies have have? have I just want to be cool, man. I just want to be cool. <laughs> Everyone's like, "Oh, what's your podcast?" And I'm like, oh, I don't it's, know, uh, it's it's uh, you haven't heard of it yet." It's, yeah. My podcast lives in Canada. It's right. uh, yeah, it's, it's, kind of the, the it's called no, I do have a title. It's called Adam Strauss is obsessed, and it will be uh, about things I'm obsessed about, which is a pretty broad topic. But but yeah, people who I like talking with. Um, subjects I'm fascinated by. Obviously, psychedelics will play heavily. Uh, I recorded one already with Joe Tuffer like a year ago. Nice. A fucking year ago. A nice. year ago in this same apartment. And I didn't release it because I was like, ah, I didn't like it. Uh, Joe was great. I just felt like, I, I felt like I did not do a good job interviewing him. But this is sort of the struggle of perfectionism. I was just going to bring, I was just going right. to say so this. So this like, is why, this is yeah. why I got to do it because it, really for me, a podcast there's a lot of, I think that's your severe weather alert. Yeah, I think that is the severe weather alert. Probably warning about it's a, flooding. Right, it's like, hey. You're I got gonna, that Saturday morning as well. Yeah, you're going to die someday, so get over your perfectionism. Yeah. It's going to be some cataclysmic <laughs> natural disaster that could happen at any moment. So yeah, I, I really am committed to doing a podcast because I enjoy this format of just having conversations because there's a lot I like talking about that I could talk about on stage, but you know, there's a certain obligation to entertain. Um, if people are spending money and getting a babysitter, whereas this right. there's, so I, I want to do it. But yeah, the perfectionism is definitely can make that challenging because it's like, well, I didn't like the way that went, so I won't put it out there, but I am going to put stuff out there 
Look for it. Adam Strauss is obsessed. We'll be out sometime in 2073, I think, is when I'll finally... There we go. All the guests I would have recorded over by the years... Time get by time you die. That'll be the first posthumous podcast. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's that's that, the Adam Strauss life? That's, that's the Adam Strauss that's, life. That's there's, the yeah, pipeline. there's there may be other... I don't know exactly what's going to happen with the mushroom cure after this. I feel like I've done it enough. And, you know, it's a very personal story. And it's my story... But I sometimes wonder if there's something, unhealthy is maybe a strong word. I, I'm Night after night, I not just recount, but if I do a good job with the performance, I'm reliving it. I'm reliving a very traumatic time in my life. I mean, don't get me wrong. The show is funny. It's, you know, there's a lot of laughs and it feels good to have people laugh. And I, and I laugh when I'm doing it. But there's also a lot of, there's some dark moments. And to really do the show well, I really do have to relive that. I have to relive when I was at my worst with the OCD. And I don't know. I just wonder if there's, you know, kind of like the argument against porn. I never thought about it in these terms where it's like, well, it's not healthy to be, you know, just relating sexually to these fantasies that kind of starts to define you maybe in certain ways. I wonder if it's a little bit the same with this where like, yeah, I start to a, a good part. I mean, I'm only doing the show once a week now. And this is part of the reason why. But when I'm doing a typical run, I could do the show sometimes six nights a week. So I'm spending a fair amount of my waking hours reliving someone who I no longer am. I mean, I am that person, but I'm in a different stage in my life. And I wonder if that maybe I pay a price for that mm -hmm. psychologically. So mm -hmm. I've done the show a lot. I value doing it because I think it helps people and people enjoy it. Not everyone clearly, but some people. Um, and I do think it can be a very healing experience because I think most people have never seen anyone be as open and vulnerable as I am on stage with this show. I think people haven't seen people that way on stage or even off stage. Like I really don't hold back. And I think it has an effect. I didn't realize this when I was first writing it, but I think seeing someone be that open about their own suffering and struggle has the effect of making people feel better about their own suffering and struggle. Because I think this is one of the insidious things about social media, but just human interaction in general is we tend to present, you know, a positive version of ourselves to the world. And it's very easy, at least for me, to believe the positive version that other people present while knowing my own internal struggle and therefore to conclude, well, everyone else is doing fine. Why am I struggling? And so I think it's healing to see someone paradoxically showing that, showing their suffering and showing right. that. So I value doing the show for that reason. Of course, you know, as a solo show, it's incredibly lucrative. Tons of groupies. It's right. always, yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> That's you're always the way you Yeah, your you listeners put it can't in, uh, see this, but I'm I'm in my ten thousand foot square foot penthouse sure. in uh in, in Tribeca right now. So it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's it, really it, this it, this is a multi billion dollar. Where is my dollar. butler? Why am I no not no the secondary? I want the, the drink butler, not the food butler. I want the massage butler. It's <laughs> I want all the butlers. All the butlers. All the butlers. I value it's, doing it, but it's it's I feel like it's time to move on to other sure. things. Sure. So, uh, you know, there is, maybe the show will be filmed and not as a special, that's a possibility. Nothing definite is happening there. I am doing the Mushroom Cure in, in Texas, in San Antonio, at the Tobin Center cool. in mid-November. Um, I'll be doing it in Portland sometime in January, but other than that, there's, you know, I, I don't think I'll be doing this show again. Okay. So, so yeah. The Mushroom Cure is wrapping up. Adam Strauss is moving on to new and bigger I'm moving frontiers. on to new, that's right. Yeah. Right, so. That's fantastic, uh, the podcast. Yeah, a new hopefully. show. <laughs> yes, buying that ten million dollar penthouse yep. in Tribeca. That's, yep. that's my, coming up soon. Yep, my second ten million dollar penthouse in Tribeca. Yeah, yeah, of course. Cool. Yeah, Great. so that's that. That's and just you know, and continuing to try to uh, figure out how to how how to live. You know, and, and I do think psychedelics will continue to be a part of that. Uh, I haven't had a real experience. I had a guided mushroom trip in May, which was powerful, but it's been hard to trace definite benefits from that. I don't regret it, I would do it again, but, uh, and then I did ayahuasca a lot. I, I drank 10 times in 16 nights in Peru at Niue Rao, where Joe Tuffer was uh, in February and March of 2017. So that was the last really extended sort of ceremonial thing I did. And I feel like it's time for, yeah, for something, something else. Something else. Yeah. Maybe some 5-MEO. Yeah, I've, or, uh... I, I haven't done that in more than a decade. Oh, you you did it a decade ago. Yeah, yeah, oh, well, synthetic, that's, synthetic. Okay, that's a story that we'll have to save. Yeah, for, yeah, uh, for the next time because I want to there, hear. There's about a that. story. Yes, there's yeah. always a story. Totally. Well, uh, Adam, thanks for joining us. And yeah, being on the podcast. It's, thanks I mean, for having me. It's great to like have. We have conversations every now and then, but I think this is the most extensive one. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciate you sitting down and. and
in doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. My butler will show you out. 